All right. Thank you once again for those of you that are uh, viewing by way of Facebook and YouTube, however we do it for Sunday School. Uh, we certainly want to uh, welcome you uh, to Sunday School for this morning. Uh, I already shared with some. We're going to go to Hebrews 13. Hebrews chapter 13. This is our actually our reading for this particular day. Uh, but just kind of summing up some things from the book of Hebrews. And if you all would, as many of you can, if you could just get a pen, paper, a pencil, uh, I got some short, just some very short notes for you to write. I didn't, I didn't actually supply you guys uh, with, uh, with some notes, but uh, short sentences, I promise. They're not going to be long sentences for you to write at all, uh, but it's just a way of just kind of being a guide, if you would, just to some of the verses that we're going to look at in ways in terms of how we're going to clump some of the verses. Um, so Hebrews chapter thir 13 is going to be our emphasis for today. Hebrews chapter 13. Uh, again, we know that uh, when we study the book of Hebrews, what we have uh, determined is that it, uh, it is demonstrating what, that Jesus Christ is better. Uh, we are talking about a time and a, and, a, and, a, and a season whereby the church, if you would, is going through a time of flux, flux, fluctuation. Uh, the fluctuation is there because uh, many are being persecuted. Peter would talk about that the diaspora that's going on and a lot of people are being persecuted as a result of their belief and their, uh, their conviction concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, there is a sense on the part of some believers that they, uh, they need to uh, uh, go back to the old system. They need to go back to the old uh, Judaic way of doing things. They need to go back to Judaism because of the persecution that they're experiencing. They're figuring, you know, if I go back uh, to those things that the people who are persecuting me are doing. Uh, the other thing is, is that the Christianity had actually become an enemy of the state. It was, a, it was, a, it was not a sanctioned government, reli gov government religion at that particular time, as far as the Romans were concerned. And because, again, a Nero, who was the dictator at that time, was really um, doing a lot to, you know, to, uh, to allow Christians to be hurt, that sort of thing. So they were looking at what is the accepted religion of that time. It would almost be it would almost be akin to those of us who are Christians. Those of us who are Christians right now in the United States of America, wherever we may be, we're Christians right now. But just imagine a world whereby um, I would say Islam becomes the dominant religion. Islam becomes the dominant religion in our country. And therefore, then, all of a sudden, now our country looks at Christianity as the wrong religion, and Islam is now the, the religion that we must embrace. And so imagine, again, I'm just, using, I'm just trying to get us to get a picture. Imagine us deciding to say, okay, I'm not going to do the Christianity thing no more. I am going to now observe Islam. But the writer to the Hebrews will be saying to us, no, 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 you can't do that. You can't, you can't do that because understand, just from, from a Judaic standpoint, what it's saying that the, the, the religion as far as the Old Testament, Moses' law and the like, it brought you to where you are. But understand, everything has now been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So to go back to that uh, literally says that you, you totally missed Jesus. You just missed him. You just totally missed Jesus. So therefore, he writes to them from the perspective to encourage them to move forward. He gives them warnings. Y'all know that handout that I already gave. Some of you already have, and hopefully you read it up until today. You've been reading with that chart right alongside you. Just kind of give you as a guide to see how to, uh, to view those various chapters and even the warnings that you look at. The warnings were not necessarily uh, a case of, of saying that you could lose your salvation. Uh, but the warnings could be an indication you probably weren't saved in the first place. And the warnings were so strong enough to help understand that it would, it, the, to go back to that was literally saying to Jesus Christ, your death, burial, and resurrection was of no effect in my life. That's how strong that warning, those warnings are. So we want to observe that. But when it comes to chapter 13, what he does now is, is to begin, begin now to give the practical things. In other words, the, the encouragement is, is to go back to Christianity. And watch this. Go back to the things you've been doing. Go back to the things that you've been doing. Go back to the things that you know about Jesus Christ. Because when you go back to those things that you already know about Jesus Christ, 
it's going, it's, going to, it's going to settle you in because now you're scrambling. You're trying to get to the temple. You're trying to observe the Mosaic law. You're trying to do all of those kinds of things. So now your life is unsettled. Go back to Christianity. Go back to Christ. Go back to the things that you originally learned from the apostles and be settled with that. So here's the first thing that I want you to write based upon Hebrews chapter 13. And again, these you're gonna, you've got seven things you're going to write, short sentences, but I know you can do it. Write them down. First one is this, continue to love. How simple is that? Continue to love. <laughs> continue to love. That's the first sentence for you to write. I'm going to say it again. Continue to love. I'm going to repeat it, but go with me now to, uh, to look, at, look, at, look at Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1, basically 1, 2, 3, and 4. He says, let brotherly love continue. So basically saying, continue to love, right? So first of all, he is saying, number one, first of all, he says, love strangers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by, by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Isn't that something? So even in the midst of a pandemic, uh, when God gives you an opportunity to be kind to other folk, do it. When God gives you an opportunity to show love, do it. He would say to these, these, these Hebrew Christians, even though you're suffering, even though you're going through a tough time, continue to love. Because that's what's going to keep you what, stable, it's going to keep you founded, it's going to keep you steadfast in terms of your character, in terms of your belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. The second thing he says, uh, verse number three, remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Wow. So what, he, what, what you recognize, because they were enemies of, of the, the, the Roman government, many of them were in jail. And I guess what he's saying uh, to us, what we got to understand, that, that everybody, everybody in jail is not an unbeliever. Go figure. There are some people who, some saints who are incarcerated who are believers. So he's saying to them, remember them. And the same thing would be for us. Let's remember them. Uh, I guess just recently I got a letter from uh, um, um, a, a, a young man in prison who's, I mean, he's in there for life. He's in his life. I mean, he committed murder years ago, and he's in prison for life. Get a letter from him every now and then from other, other guys, and they, they, they are in prison, but they are saved. They love God. They worship. They preach. They sing. They, they serve each other, all of that kind of thing while they're in prison. So one of the things that he's saying, uh, he would say that to those that, that, that in that time, because their fellow believers were going through. So what he, he reminds us of this. Whatever Rodney is going through, I go through it. Whatever Warren is experiencing, I experience it. Whatever Brian may be suffering through, I experience Whatever Mac goes through, whatever Brother Leonard experiences in life, I experience the same thing. So he says to remember, why? Because we're connected to each other in the body of Christ. So even when we're going through a bad time, God is saying we've got to continue to love. Who do we love? We're loving the strangers. We're loving the saints who are incarcerated. And the other thing he said, love your spouse. Look at, look at, look at, look at verse 4. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers, what? God will judge. Because what, what he's saying, in times when, when we're going through persecution, or times when we can be going through a pandemic, times when you're going through a rough time, if you're not careful, as spouses, we can neglect each other. Yeah, we can neglect each other. We can, we, can, we, can, we can be difficult toward one another. We can be domineering toward one another. I think we've heard the, uh, the serious rise that's going on in domestic violence now. And as I said, when I hear that number, I've told you all that before, guys, uh, when I hear that number, I don't just think about unbelievers doing this. I be thinking in my mind, this possibility is Christians who are experiencing well, domestic violence. So what he's saying the fact that you're going to be, to be to be stable, to be steadfast, to be on a solid foundation, you got to remember because well, here's the deal. When you're going through what you're going through, you also got to keep in mind that your marriage is a demonstration of Christ's love for the church. You're not married just to be married. You are, and then of course the other thing, the other implication that would be is that he says marriage, the bed is undefiled. And the other thing you got to keep in mind, when God talks about marriage, every time God mentioned marriage in the Bible, it is always a man and a woman. It is always. It's never, it's never anything else other than, if you look at marriage in the Bible, it's a man and a woman. It's never a man and a man. It's never a woman and a woman. 
So he's saying marriage is honorable in all, among all, and the bed undefiled. But fornicators, again, that's sexual immor immorality, period. So if it's not a sexual union between a husband and a wife, it's immoral. So if it's a man and a man, it's immoral. If it's a woman and a woman, it's immoral. If it's a man with another woman other than his wife, it's immoral. The only place that God is saying it's okay is in a marriage between a husband and a wife. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. Count on the Lord. Count, just write that down. First of all, you wrote, continue to love. That was the first sentence. Here's the second sentence. Count on the Lord. Count on the Lord. Count on the Lord. Uh, count on the Lord. Uh, go with me, if you will, to verse 5. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. In other words, live your life, your ca the, the character of your life, without being greedy. That's what covetous means. Covetous means I want what everybody else got. <laughs> I see something, so I want it. Brother Edward will get something new, so I want to have what Brother Edward got. Uh, Jimmy buy something new, I want to get. I want to get. That's greedy. That's covetous. So he's saying, um, what we're to do with that? Uh, and then he says, be content with such things as you have. That's why I say count on the Lord. Be content with what you have. Whatever car you got, whatever clothes you got, whatever cash you got, whatever commodities you got, thank God for it. Be happy about it. You might say, hey, man, my car is not the best shape, but thank God for your car. <laughs> My house is not the best house, but thank God for your house. Whatever it is you got, the Bible says what? To be content in such things. Because, again, remember what he is saying to those who were the Christians who were Hebrews. They were experiencing persecution, right? They're going through a tough time. They are, they are enemies of the state, and now they can't go where they used to go, do things that they used to do. And in a very real sense, they are coveting the fact that those who are Jews are not suffering like they are suffering. Those who are in Judaism are not suffering like they are suffering. And now they wish they could, they could be back with the Judaizers. And God said, no, 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 be content with being a Christian. Yeah. Be satisfied with being a follower of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing, y'all? To think about, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'm content with that. I'm cool with that. I don't need no other religion. I don't need no other Savior. I don't need no other Lord. I am totally content with Christ. But understand, contentment for other things is a direct result of my contentment with Christ. If I'm not satisfied with Jesus, I'm probably not going to be satisfied with a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> if Jesus is not my satisfaction, it's a great possibility I'm not going to be satisfied with too many other things. Amen? So he says it again. I count on the Lord. Don't be greedy, but be grateful. Right? Watch this. For he himself has said, why, why do I count on him? I will what? I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know, those of you that are watching by way of Facebook, raise your hand if you believe that. The Lord said, <laughs> I'm never going to leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. You guys that are in here, y'all believe that? Y'all believe that? I'll never leave you. That's a promise that God is making to us. So what do we do? We count on who? We count on the Lord. So, so we may boldly say, I love that verse 6, the Lord is my helper. Did you get that? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. So he asked the question, what can man do to me? Yeah. You know, you know sometimes, they, and it's just one of them side notes, y'all. Sometimes I hear people talk about, uh, well, Pastor, you know, you don't want everybody praying for you. And I tell them, I really don't care who prayed for me. It really, to me, it really doesn't matter who prayed for me. Because at the end of the day, it's not your prayer. It's the God you pray to. So I'm counting on the God you pray to to answer prayer. Not necessarily, you know, because they say, you know, some, they, they, the, 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 the thought is that some people who are not right and some people hypocrites and all of that. And, you know, I don't want, I don't want everybody. I don't care who prayed for me. It don't make no difference. I mean, it, it, it really don't. I mean, it could be the most creepiest man in the world can pray for me. It don't, it don't matter. It doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, God, God is my helper. And if I pray, if I say, our Father who is in heaven, well, guess what? <laughs> it's, it's something about my connection. So, so, so we count on the fact that he says we don't be greedy, but we be grateful. Why? Because the Lord is our helper. Does it make sense, guys? Here's, here's the third thing. Consider the leaders. Consider your leaders. I'm going to say it this way. Consider your leaders. 
very, very brief, consider your leaders in the midst of it all. Because remember, here's the thing, that you would have to believe that the pastors, uh, those teachers of that particular time, if they're teaching the word of God, and then they're starting to see members not show up for church. They're starting to see members are not participating in any whatever, if they have a local Bible study, whatever. In that time, they were seeing that. You know that had to be a source of concern for the pastors, right? So what he said is consider the leaders. In other words, if they're teaching you the word of God, and notice how he says it in verse 7 and 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 and 8. Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith, what? Follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Why do you do that? Look at verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the reason we ought to consider your leaders is that if your leaders are teaching and preaching the word of God, and we know that ultimately Jesus is the fulfillment of the word of God. Matter of fact, Jesus says he's the word, right? Uh, God, uh, in the beginning, God created, in the, and the word was in the beginning, and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made, right? So as a result now, when your leader, your pastor, your event, your, your, your Sunday school teacher, whoever that person may be, especially as it relates to the church order, when they are teaching, when we're teaching the word of God, it is just as Jesus is teaching. Because we're not coming up with anything new. We're not coming up with something that God didn't say. Because remember, the, one of the things that, that we learned in the book of John, John, well John, I think John 16, Jesus says, what do you say? I'm going to send a helper, right? But he's not going to testify of himself. The Holy Ghost don't talk about himself. But he says he's going to testify what? Of me. So, so how, how does it go? Jesus is the word. Jesus gave it to the apostles, correct? The apostles wrote it down. They put it in letters. They gave it to the pastors, the elders of the church. The elders of the church preserved the word of God. It is passed down from generation to generation to generation. So ultimately, who is it? It's Jesus. So when you remember your rulers, those who have ruled over you, and you, you do what, they, what, what, what they're saying that you ought to do, what it's saying is that you're really obeying who? Jesus. That's the amazing thing. You know, and sometimes, and I think sometimes we can be at fault with that uh, as pastors, that we, that we want you to listen to us. But in reality, it's not listening to us. It's really you listening to Jesus. As long as, watch this, we're saying what Jesus said. Does that make sense, guys? We're saying what Jesus said. Any comments, questions before we, before we go to the next part? Any questions, any comments? Anybody? Anybody? Some of y'all on the conference line? Anybody got any comment? All right, Rodney, we're listening to you. Yeah, I, bro, Brother Ben is reiterating what I said about not minding anybody praying for me. Two men on the cross. That's exactly right. That's what the script, they were, they were criminals. That's how scripture describes them. He prayed. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That is it. It doesn't. It doesn't. I love it. I love it. That's a good, great, great illustration. Great illustration. Jesus is talking about, I mean, brother, brother Ben is mentioning the two men that were on the cross. For all intents and purposes, these were unbelievers. One just had enough to sense to say, Lord, when you get in your kingdom, remember me. At that point, he was a criminal. He would, you, would count, you would count him as an unbeliever. But he prayed, and watch this, and the Lord heard his prayer. Today you're going to be with me in paradise. So it's not the issue of really who's praying. It's the issue of who's answering prayer. You know, so that's that's. That's the, uh, you know, that's the focal part. So we said, what, continue to love. That was number one. Count on the Lord, number two. Consider the leaders, number three. This one just a little bit longer, but, 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 but I'm, remember, I'm going to repeat it, so don't, don't, don't worry about it. Commit to suffer for Christ. Commit to suffer for Christ. Let me say it again. Commit to suffer for Christ. Let me say that one more time. Commit to suffer for for Christ. Don't worry about it. I told y'all I'm going to repeat it again that you'll be able to fill in the blanks if you missed it. Go with me now to verse 9. Hebrews chapter 9. Look at verse 9. He says, do, do not be carried away with various uh, strange doctrines, 
uh, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods, um, because now what he's taking us back to the Old Testament, which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. Notice he says in verse 10, we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. He's taking it back to the Old Testament because you remember, whenever they would bring their sacrifices to the Lord, there were certain sacrifices that the priest could eat, right? But then there were certain sacrifices he could not eat, correct? Based upon those sacrifices. So he says in verse 11, kind of bringing this together, for the bodies of those animals whose blood brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside of the camp. So, so what he's saying, they brought, they brought that sacrifice to the altar, but they couldn't eat from that sacrifice. Why? Because it was considered what? The burnt offering. And so the burnt offering had to actually be taken what? Out of the camp, correct? So look at the analogy that he gives. Therefore, I love that, y'all. Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. What happened with Jesus? Suffered what? Outside the gate, therefore, let's go forth to him. Where? Outside the, the camp. Doing what? Bearing his reproach. <laughs> so what? So his, so again, look, notice how the Hebrew writer, the, the writer of the Hebrews is bringing it together for the people. Because remember, they're going, they want to go back to the Judaic system, right? So if you go back to the Judaic system, that means you're going to go back to where they're offering sacrifices. Correct, all right? But then think about that. The, the burnt offering was considered the, you know, the, the greatest sacrifice that they could offer. At that point, the burnt offering now is taken outside the camp. So Jesus becomes the greatest sacrifice for our sins in that, watch this, he was totally consumed. The burnt offering was always the offering that, that nobody ate from. It was the offering that God would consume the whole thing. It would burn it up. That's what it literally meant, the burnt offering. So Jesus now becomes the example of the burnt offering, just like the burnt offering in the Judaic system. He was actually crucified outside of Jerusalem. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> that God made a determination that Jesus would be crucified outside of Jerusalem. So again, what, so what did that show? That showed again that, again, the sins of the people were forgiven, but it was showing that the burnt offering was something that was to be taken away. It was to be taken away from the temple. It was to be taken away, if you would, from the presence of God and all of that. So Jesus became our sacrifice. He became our total sacrifice. So what do you say? How do we get to Jesus? We got to go outside the camp. We can't stay in the temple to get to Jesus. <laughs> Because Jesus represents the, 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 watch this, the death of all, not just of the Jews who are part of the temple, but he rep represents the sacrifice of everyone who would believe in him. He's outside the camp. So what do we do? We go outside the camp where he is. Now, if you go there, you got to remember when he went there, he was suffering. So, so, so for us as believers to exempt ourselves from suffering does not identify us with Jesus Christ. Brothers, we got to be willing to take some stuff. Bottom line, we got to be willing to go through some stuff. We got to be willing to face some challenges. We got to be willing to say like Job, are we to accept good and not evil? Are we to expect only thing, everything to be all right with us all the time and never have no bad? Are we expect good days all the time and not bad days? Are we expecting everybody we know to stay alive and, and nobody die? That's not our reality. That's not our reality. He's saying for those of us who are Christians, we have to commit to suffer for Christ, for the sake of Jesus Christ. There, I'm looking at the one, one more verse. Uh, that, well, that was it, verse 13. Bearing his reproach. Bearing his reproach. Bearing his burden. Bearing what Jesus went through. Bearing what Jesus had to suffer. We got to be willing to suffer along with him. Here's a, we said continue to love, count on the Lord, consider the leaders, commit to suffer for Christ. Here's the other one. Charge yourself with obeying those in charge. I'm, I'm, I'm using, I like Brother Edward, I'm going to use Brother Edward's word, in charge. I like that word, I like that word. Charge yourself 
with obeying those in charge. <laughs> charge yourself with obeying those in charge. Look at verse 17. Come with me there, if you will. Obey those who rule over you. So that's a decision you got to make. So you got to charge yourself. You know how we say that song, a charge to keep I have? I got to charge myself to obey those that have the rule over me. I don't want to take the attitude, he a man just like me. That's true. But at the same time, there's a responsibility that God gives us to be able to obey those that have rule over us. He says it, obey those that rule over you and do what? And be submissive. And now watch this, in a very real sense, that's not only to those who would be believing, but even to the unbelieving. Remember when, what, 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 what Paul teaches us in the book of Colossians? You don't serve your boss just with eye service. So if you got a boss, even though he's an unbeliever, you still got to be submissive on your job because that's what God has called for you to do. So it's not only, not only would it include the believer, like again, me as your pastor, but it would also include the, that, that person, that supervisor on your job who may not be a believer. The Bible is saying to still be what submissive to him. Why? Because what it demonstrates, it demonstrates the character of Christ. You're letting your light shine, right? So he says, obey those that have rule over you and be submissive. Again, he's taking it back. This is important. He said, for they watch over, they watch, over, they watch for your souls. As those who must give an account. Um, let them do so with joy, not with grief. For that would be what? Unprofitable to you. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. I don't know what the Lord is going to do with this. I don't know if the Lord is doing this right now. I can't be honest. I, can't, I cannot tell you when this all plays out. But it does tell me that in some way, somehow, I as a pastor, we as pastors, we as elders, are going to give an account for each and every one of y'all. Some kind of way. I'm not sure how you do it. I guess, I guess the issue is, what, I, well, let me just say it this way. I guess what it, the, the, we would look at the admonitions that we would have in the book of Titus. Titus actually tells us to mark a divisive person. What, I think what it's saying, you don't want to be a disruptive or divisive person in the church. You don't want to be a person that may be accused of uh, or may be responsible for teaching false teaching, that sort of thing. Because, remember, these are things that in, the, in, in, in terms of a church, in terms of leadership, these are things that I'm saying as a pastor, as an elder, I would pray about. And so if Brother Ben had a reputation of being divisive and distractive in the church, I'm going to take that to God in prayer. Say, Lord, I mean... I don't know what to do with Ben no more, Lord. I don't, I don't know. I mean, he, we, 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 we admonish him. We're telling him what he needs to do. But he still chooses to be. So what God, I, I believe, I, I'm, I'm saying that. I believe that's what God is saying, that, that that kind of thing, because I'm giving account for you. I'm just using it as an illustration, Ben. I'm giving account for you being a disruptive and divisive member. And God said that was not profitable for you. <laughs> God said that's not a healthy place that you want to be. So that's what I'm saying. We got we to gotta charge yourself. I got to make the decision as a man that I'm going to be under the leadership of somebody. I'm going to answer to somebody. I'm going to be accountable to somebody. So charge yourself with obeying, being obedient to those in charge. Here's a short one, number six, and we're almost done. Consistently pray. Consistently pray. Consistently pray. That's number six. He wrote it down, number six, consistently pray. He picks it up at verse 18, if you would just come with me there. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. So the, the, the goal there, what, he, what, he, what he's really saying, uh, the Hebrew writer who's writing to them, it is apparent that he is writing and he's constrained. He's in prison. He doesn't have his freedom. So he's asking the church to do what? To pray for him. <laughs> he's asking the church, in this case, he's asking the church to pray uh, because he, what is it, how does he describe himself, his character? We are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. In other words, we're in prison, but it's not because we've done anything wrong. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think some of us can, can look back or, or look at it now and say, all of us are going through the pandemic, but it's not necessarily because of all of us have done something wrong. It's just that we're experiencing the judgment of God, just like everybody else is. But he's saying, in a good conscience, when I, when I, he said, when I check myself, when I check my character, again, he's not claiming I'm sinless. He's just saying, 
from a from a from a, a consciousness standpoint, I've lived honorably before people. I've 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 lived out my Christian character. Watch this. When I when I was wrong, I said I was wrong. Uh, when I did something that I should not have done, I did what I could to correct whatever that was because that's what it really means to live honorably. It doesn't mean I'm not gonna mess up. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to say some words and do some things, but it does mean that I'm going to confess. It does mean that I'm going to correct my way. It does mean that I'm going to ask folk to forgive me when I've done things that have been out, outside of the will of God. So, but, 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 but watch this. But it comes with what? Consistently praying. So, so when we talk about, when we talk about uh, maybe that brothers and sisters are struggling through the pandemic, what do we do? We pray for them. There are some people who are really having a hard time, man. I think, I think you guys as, as, a, as a deacons, y'all talk to some folk, and they got some folk who are very, they're very fearful. They're scared. So what do you do? You keep praying for them. You know that those, uh, those persons, uh, I, I think about that a lot of times, people who have been incarcerated unjustly. We ought to pray for their release. <laughs> people who are in prison. We ought to pray for them. Those who are going through those, those domestic violence situations, we ought to pray for them. And so, again, that's just kind of the full gamut of us, again, consistently praying for everyone. And here's a final thing. Again, when we say we continue to love, that was number one. Count on the Lord. Number two. What was number three, guys, those of you in here? Consider the leaders. Uh, number four, commit to suffer for Christ. Number, number five, charge yourself with, being, with obeying those in charge. Number six was what? Consistently pray. And here's the final thing. Continue to be who God made you to be. Continue to be who God made you to be. One more time. Continue to be who God made you to be. Let me say it again. Continue to be who God made you to be. That's the seventh one. One more time. Continue to be who God made you to be. So let's look at who we are. Verse, on that verse 20, if you'll come with me there. Now may the God of peace, wow. So, so one of the things that the Bible teaches me is that uh, he would say, blessed are, blessed are what, the peacemakers? Yeah, because we're going to be called with the children of God. One of the things that I have as a believer, uh, the fact the Holy Spirit lives in me, one of the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, and what? Peace, all right? So that, that's a part of that reality that God has given us. Uh, he would remind us again, uh, now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. This is a benediction actually he's given. His last words he's given. <clears throat> the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Watch this. Make you what? Complete. Basically what he's saying. May he continue to prepare you. Continue to prepare you. Because when you go back to Ephesians chapter 4, the Bible says that he, what he's given, he gives some pastors, some, some, I mean, some prophets, some apostles, some pastors, some teachers, some evangelists, what, for the equipping of the saints so that we might be, what, thoroughly equipped, what for? No matter what it is that God has us, we're able to be equipped for the work of the ministry. So what he's saying, he's he make you complete in every word to do what? To do his will. So what that says to me, who am I? I am a servant of God. And God is preparing me, us, you, for the work that he has for us. Uh, working, watch, watch. Working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse 22, I appeal to you. What is this? What is, how does he refer to us as what? Brethren. And so we, we, you know, we, are, we, are, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, uh, Brian is here today. Jermaine is his brother. Uh, but he clearly understand that Brian understands that's his biological brother. But in Christ, he got many brothers. So he reminds us that's who we are. We're servants of God. But we're brothers and sisters who belong, who are, again, who are belong to the family of God. I appeal to you, brethren. Bear with the word of exhortation. So who are we? We're people of the word. We're people of the word of God. So the, 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 the writer to the Hebrews is saying to them, bear with me with what I just shared with you. I know it's tough. I know it's rough. I know you all are going through persecution. But listen to the word of God so you can come through this thing and you come out right on the other side. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever had the experience in life 
that whatever it is you're going through, but then you obeyed the word of God. But when you obeyed the word of God, you found out you came out better on the other side. Rather than when you did your own thing, tried to make it your own way, and man, that was just a hard, it was just, it was just rough, it was tough. But God, God, God has a way of showing us. When we go to his word, and sometimes some of the things that we're saying, when things are really rough, uh, you know, sometimes people want to check out from the word, don't want to be engaged in the word. I tell you all before, my greatest concern right now is that many of our members are no longer connecting. I believe that most are doing well when it comes to the worship on Sunday morning, but I, I'm concerned about connection with Bible study, connection with the Zoom calls, connection with the conference calls, those kinds of things. You got to stay connected to the body because why? You are a person of the word. Here's another final thing, and we're done. For I have written to you in few words, Know that our brother in Timothy has been set free, with whom uh, I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you. He's reminding us again. And all the saints, this is who we are. We are, we are part of the church of Jesus Christ. God has given us leaders that are over us, but God has also given us people that we're connected to in the body of Christ. Those from Italy greet you. Grace, we are people of grace. Be with you all. Amen. <laughs> Because that's who we are. And what God is saying, in the midst of all that we're going through, we got to continue to be who we are. We have the character of Christ. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have the power of God. So what God is saying to us, let's be who we are. Just one final thing I want to share with you all. Listen, for those of you men, you're the men. You are the leaders of your homes. Uh, you all heard what I said about uh, the whole thing with Thanksgiving. And I know... I know, I know that uh, if some folk, you know, listening to what I'm saying, but they're like, Pastor, you ain't gonna, you know, you ain't gonna tell me what to do. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. All right, I'm saying to you, as uh, as men of your home, to uh, just take the leadership to that. Listen, you know, one of the things that I've learned, there are times that I say some things to my wife, she doesn't agree with me, and so I live with the reality. She's gonna be a little upset with me uh, for a little while, but you know what? God has given me a spiritual woman. And I know at some point she's going to recognize what I'm saying is right. Not according just because I said it, according to the word of God. So I'm saying in the midst of this pandemic, be the leader that God made you to be in your home. Make the decisions that need to be made. Be unpopular if you have to be unpopular, but make the decisions that you know are right. According to the word of God, according to what the government is saying for us to do in order for us to get around this situation. Because it is quite amazing, folks, quite amazing, the fact that we fail to obey government. And as a result of our failure to obey government, this thing is coming back, doubling back. I mean, and twice, twice the power that it had the first time it appears. But one of the things that we have to look at is, are we obeying God based upon, watch this, government that has been ordained by God so that we might lead, he would say, a quiet and peaceable life in all reverence. So I'm just saying, you know, if you got to have those hard conversations today, do them today, do them tomorrow if you have to. Uh, you can say, hey, listen, I know what we were talking about doing for Thanksgiving, but we need to rethink this thing. We're going to delay it. We're not going to do it for a while. We're going to do something later on. But I'm saying be the men that God has called for you to be in your homes because you know, again, it's the right thing to do. If you got some concerns, guys, y'all know y'all can always call me, always, you know, talk to me. Um, whatever I can do to help you. I'm not trying to run your house. I'm just trying to have you run your house uh, because ultimately God would say, God would say, you are the one responsible for the well-being of that particular home. Amen? So I'm just, again, just a personal challenge again to each and every, every one of you. Father, how we love you again and thank you so much for your word. As you will remind us to continue to love, count on the Lord, consider our leaders, commit to suffer for Christ, to charge ourselves with obe obeying those who are in charge, to consistently pray, and then continue to be who God made us to be. So we thank you for these reminders as we go forth. I pray again that your word will fall on good ground in the hearts and minds of these, your people. Be with us, lead, guard, guide us, direct us, and protect us, and we'll be careful to give you the honor, the praise, and the glory that belongs to nobody else, that you don't share with nobody else. It's in Christ's name we pray. In his name alone we pray these things. Amen. Thank you again for listening in. Remember, no other meetings this week. So enjoy, enjoy your time with your family. But I would encourage you again to do the best that we are called to do as it relates to Thanksgiving. Until we meet again. Love you, brothers. Bye-bye. Bless you, sir. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for coming on the conference call. <laughs>